Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am your host with me. My, I am your host, Dale Melchin, and with me is Hody Johns. And today we're talking about the condemnation of judgment. Hey, Hody, how you doing? Doing great. Dale, how are you doing today, buddy? Doing, I'm going to lie and say I'm doing tremendous. <laughs> um, it's been a Monday. Yeah. Monday is Monday. But uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about the condemnation of judgment. So I'll, I did the intro, so why don't you go ahead and go ahead and lead it off, Hody? Sure. So judgment is one of those that I think a lot of people struggle with, especially if you're... I, I find that it's like the last dragon to slay if you're a good person. Because at some point you just say, man, I've learned so much. I want to share this and push this on the rest of the world. Because there's having values and you've got these great values. And then you say, well, I really want to push them on everybody else. So a lot of judgment actually comes from a very good place. That being said, I don't want to downplay how bad and evil judgment is. There are actually three times in the scriptures that the apostles approach Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not a religious person, that's okay. Uh, I am going to tell you this story because I find it's pertinent to me. But you might find it's pertinent to you as well. But the story is effective whether you're a religious folk or not. But either way, the apostles approach Jesus and they say, Hey, buddy. Uh, how do we know we're saved? How do we get saved? How do we know if we've achieved forgiveness because we've all sinned? And all three times, Jesus decides to say, well, that depends how few times you've judged people. And he gives three different analogies. On one hand, he says, well, this is, uh, you know, 77 times seven or how many times you want to be forgiven. When he talks about forgiving their neighbor, they say, oh, how many times do I want to be forgiven? Well, that depends on how many times you forgive. He also states that the stick with which you measure others will be used to measure yourself. That's one maybe is the most effective to me. That if you say, well, I judge other people this way, but that's okay. I'm sure I won't get judged this way either. Well, unfortunately, when it comes to the final days, God's going to judge you the same way that you judge other people. So if you decide to be very critical and very negative and push your virtues onto somebody else, imagine how glory the glory of God is going to look when he says, well, you've got to stack up on my judgment now, buddy. It's not going to look good or pretty. So for me, those are kind of the biggest, that, that's the warning sign. Even before we get into the subject, that's why I think that this is important. It's not just, eh, sometimes I judge people, it's a little small struggle like gossiping. It's such a heavy problem that if you do judge people, you're going to hell. And that is the stakes that we're dealing with here. So uh, what, what are your thoughts on that, Dale? Well, you totally ripped out of my hands the idea of coming at it from a comedic standpoint. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, as far as interpretation goes i mean that it sounds like you're making it sound like the unforgivable sin which i don't i don't think that judgment is the unforgivable sin because you know in you know in light of our our frail humanity all sins can be forgiven but sure. um we're coming at this well i won't get into the get into our differences but i mean i will start off by affirming what the scripture does say i mean it not only does it have the uh the metaphysical implications for the afterlife but also it really I'll start on the serious side of the house first, because not only are those um, those eternal um, implications for for judgment, but also in this life, if you if you if you're serious, if you're if you're serious and condemning in the nature of your judgment, it's you create you care, you create a prison for yourself. Another another um, parable that Jesus talks about is um, the and I, I'm trying to remember exactly, but it's one of the parables of the servants where he talks about if you if you do not forgive your brother uh, your sins, you will not be forgiven. You will be put in prison until you've paid the last penny. And on that note, yeah, it's a very serious matter because you you basically you're you're binding your own chain, um, you know. And that that starts in this life as well because eventually you not only rack up. You not only rack up those metaphysical points, but you also create habits for yourself where you're constantly not able to see the good in other people. And I, I will, you know, pull off the mask a little bit uh, myself. Earlier on, when I was uh, going through a Calvinist cage stage, I constantly judged other folks who didn't see what I saw, and it wasn't good. It was alienating. It alienated my family. Um, had a few close calls there, and it didn't. 
it didn't help me get my message out at all um, for what I was trying to do. And I think from a bigger picture scale, but not so much an eternal standpoint, I think we tend to have this problem as, as libertarians as well. You know, why, why can't the person see this, you know, this way? And I think part of it's a process we have to, sometimes we have to make the mistake before we learn from it. But I think on the serious side of the house, yeah, it's a problem. It's an energy drain. It, it forms bad habits in your own mind. So that's, that's kind of where I stand on, at least on the serious side of it. Yeah. Well, and, and let's get away from the religion for a second, because I do want to bring everybody in. I just think that that helps kind of show you where the stakes are at. But, but just as far as why, why religious folks, why do they condemn, why, why do these central religious fi figures condemn judgment the way that they do? And the reason really is, is because it is very impactful to the soul and impactful to your mind, even if you don't believe in some type of soul or spirit. You get in this mentality of judgment. You just say, well, I've assessed that you don't know as much as me and therefore your experiences aren't valid. You invalidate somebody else's experiences. That's actually the first fallacy you learn is to not invalidate anybody else's experiences when you're talking with them. Yet we've gotten into this age and internet era. And I won't say it's just the internet. People have been judging people forever. Heck, we're talking about biblical times and they're judging people and having a problem. So, so let's talk about why it's unhealthy and how to maybe give healthy criticism versus giving unhealthy judgment. Because I think people here judge and they just say, well, I have to determine a lot of things in my life. I have to be able to look at things and say, well, this is a good or this is bad. I'm, I've judged that drugs are bad for me, so I'm not going to do them. That now, wouldn't you agree, Dale, that's not actually a judgment. That's just appropriate skepticism. It's discrimination, Hody. I mean, it's it's discriminating between one thing and another. I know I'm throwing in a lot of things here, but and it's not and it is a judgment, but it's not a, a judgment in the sense of you're judging the value of the other person, which I think that's the that's the problem when we from a psychological or, or you know psychological standpoint, when we judge the value of another person on the basis of their lack of knowledge, wealth, um, intelligence, skill, that sort of thing. So there, I guess one of the problems with the English language is that we have one word that can have so many different meanings in a context. Maybe I've got that backwards, but that it's one thing, but to, to say this is this and this is that where that I think the big problem is, is judging is judging or condemning persons because of a perceived lack of whatever trait we think they should have. Yeah, so they talk about removing the plank out of your eye before you remove the splinter out of somebody else's. Uh, and, and so a lot of people think like, well, I judge, uh, I, I judge people who cheat, right? Like somebody who cheats on their spouse. Well, I judge them heavily because I don't cheat, cheat on my spouse. But I gossip mm -hmm. all day and I do these other little minor sins. But I wouldn't dare, you know, do all these other evil things, you know, uh, the, those really bad things. But that really indicates that you have no idea where they come from. We have so many problems and there are so many things that people are going through and i'm not saying that we should ever accept or put into mainstream cheating on your spouse goodness knows i would never do it but that when somebody does the very fact that i would never do it kind of means i have no right to judge because i have no understanding of where they came from nobody goes into cheating thinking i hate my spouse what's the best way i can get back at them today most of the time they're battling some inner urge or some carnal craving now if i don't feel that carnal craving then i have no idea where they're coming from c.s lewis actually has a really good example for this when he wrote mere christianity he said well why is it that uh, he had a friend who wrote to him and said there's not there's nothing about gambling in this book and gambling's a real horrible sin and he said, you know, that might be true, but I've just never struggled with gambling and I don't understand it enough to be able to make judgments about it, to be able to talk about it and relate to somebody. And I think that that really impacted me to say that before I can stand out and judge somebody, I have to understand them first and understand where they're coming from. And, and how often, especially in the liberty movement, do we say, oh, you can condemn you for doing this. You, you think I belong, to, you believe in taxation and you believe in a wall and you want, you, you want these people to do this and, and, and how dare you not love the poor. And they say all these things. And, but, you know, and, and so we say, well, hold on, time out now real quick. I, I think everybody loves the poor. 
They just differ on exactly how to fix the problem. Now, sometimes they come from a very ignorant place of saying, well, the poor deserve to rot, or you know, the poor can just lift themselves up by their bootstraps and just completely ignore all the false scarcities that our economy has created. But mm-hmm. isn't it better to teach them than to just be like, you're an idiot, and now I'm just going to get into a, you know, it's a self-serving internet, internet argument at that point for me to, to do battle with those people and just make it very public and be like, this person is so stupid, they'll never get it. It's, it's really just self-serving. Yeah, it is. Um, but then are we, are we not causing more problems by judging those who judge, Hody? <laughs> J- judging the judges. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm ju- judge section. I had to I had to I had to slip the comedy in there somewhere because, um, <laughs> you know, it's counterproductive. And I think the, the biggest um, I think the biggest solution to it, it starts with the individual. You have to be able to you have to be able to hold you have to be able to hold both tools in different hands because you do have to be able to make judgment calls on situations and things. And um, even when you're looking to hire somebody, you know, you do have to make certain calls on that. So it's not. I want to emphasize that we're not necessarily talking about making judgments about what would be a good fit where we're talking about personal condemnation of, of other people. That might be the, the best way to go about defining it. But um, I'm trying to get I'm trying to I am trying to segue into trying to making this uh, funny, but I just don't know how to do it now since you led with the uh, since you led with the scripture. But I think the, the most important thing to, to understand is it's damaging to yourself and it it ultimately when it when it becomes something along the lines of when it comes when it comes along the lines of judging to the point where it's no longer you're not just being funny about pointing out something in the world you're it serves no purpose it it, it's it's divisive and i hate to use this word but it's problematic to to the cause whichever whichever cause that may be because it, it comes from you know we do it in the liberty movement and then you know folks in the other camps do the same thing so the, the i think the biggest i'll get to my point i know somebody's probably hollering in the chat that he's rambling so <laughs> i'll just uh i'll get to the point i think it's recognizing the other tool that we need to, get, to be able to wield is recognizing our own frailty our own humanity and seeing that in others not to sound all mushy but to recognize that there's and recognize not only our human frailty but recognize there's a difference between malevolence and stupidity because they're you know I'm far more likely to, to be harsher on somebody who violates the nap than somebody who's just made bad life choices. And our justicism doesn't our justicism doesn't seem to do that. But I think we as individuals need to be able to need to be able to take control of, of our own minds and cognizance and be able to structure the, the value judgments that we make. And, you know, the necessary because part of it is it, it is necessary, but getting into the point where you're where you're con- where you're basically dismissing somebody and saying they have no value. That's where the problem gets, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. The, and, and that's kind of the same line that I draw too. And, and what you said, I mean, even to back up real quick, what you said about really twisting the knife in somebody they're they're already struggling. Look, somebody's already hurt, you know? And so if, if it's a hurt that they know, uh, cheating on a spouse is a good example. Uh, you've gotten caught in a lie. You're very hurt at that moment. Now you're the aggressor, But this is why instead of just piling on being like, hey, you're a liar. Well, they got caught in a lie. So what's what's the point right there? You know, that they're already hurt. So at that point, being like saying you lied louder. I mean, what's the point? And, And at the same time, being like, okay, let's get on the path to healing. Let's work on actually improving from this situation. And can you imagine? I mean, we've all got caught lying before, I think. I never have, Hody. Maybe you <laughs> well, just caught me saying that. You're just you're too good a liar. But most of us get caught in a lie <laughs> at some point, you know. And I get caught in a lie, and, and I've been caught in a lie before, and it it hurts. And which what would have really changed my life in those situations aren't the people who shout from the rooftops, "Hey, this guy's a liar. He just lied." It's this person who says, like, you know, "Hey, man, I know you lied, and it did hurt my feelings." Or, you know, maybe you did do some damage, but hey, let's get over this. Let's be friends. Just please don't do that again. You know, like you're you're desperate for healing at that point. And I think it's no wonder that religion, which is, you know, predominantly about healing, is that 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 it would be so integral to forgive instead of judge other people, because that's where the healing comes from. Now, 
on the other side, there's let, let's talk about judgment now. Let, let's start the most base form of judgment. My boyfriend has tattoos and my grandma hates it, you know, or, or, you know, or my girlfriend smokes and my mom really hates smokers. And so these are easy to dismiss because I, I think all of us are kind of like, come on, get over it. You know, grandma, can you please make my girlfriend slash boyfriend feel welcome instead of trying to jump through all your hoops? That hurts. You know, and it, it's not fun to bring somebody home into that environment, and it will never be a home for them. And now, even if you think, oh, you know, I'm anti-tattoo, anti-smoking, anti-whatever it is behavior that you hate, when you just, when you cast judgment, you're casting condemnation. You say, I hate your tattoos. I hate the fact that you smoke. You, you're not offering a solution. This isn't saying, hey, did you ever want to stop or can I help you how? You know, the real trick is if you want to talk about trapping these people, bring them in with love, get them really close, make them care about what you have to say. This is the Jesus tactic, right? Make them care right. about what you have to say first by being a good person and healing their wounds. And then saying like, oh yeah, like I, I'm also against, you know, adultery. But I mean, I don't have to say that to an adulterer. It's just all of a sudden, if the person knows that that's where I stand and they trust my judgment, suddenly they're going to say, hey man, I want to reach out to you real quick. Can you tell me more about that? Because that, I, I, I've committed adultery and I need to know how to fix that. Well, I, I can speak more to the, the side of the house of the smoking because I, I used to be a smoker. That's why you see me constantly touching my mouth during these podcasts as I'm reaching for nicotine gum, basically for the safety of everyone in this house and everyone, <laughs> everyone else, because nicotine withdrawals can be a pain. But I, I think you're right. You're spot on with drawing, you know, quote unquote, you don't necessarily want to do it as manipulation, but be genuine and and draw the person in with with grace and humility and recognizing their frailty in the sense of, OK, you know, this is her. This is my. um you know, my, my daughter's boyfriend, whatever, you know, let's get to know them a little bit better. Cause oftentimes, um, oftentimes it's, we, we make the judgments on a superficial level. Now, the other thing that the, the, the partner, the, the person who's the daughter, whose grandmother it is or whatever, I'm, I'm getting confused on all these contrived relationships. <laughs> the here, hypotheticals let, that I created. Yeah. But <laughs> let me, let me, let me address them. The, the problem with grandma is that she's, had years and years of conditioning mm -hmm. that kind of bind her whether it's through her through her own doing or through the, through the conditioning of others that hold her to that position so on the one side the person with the tattoos needs to understand where where grandma's coming from now that doesn't necessarily excuse grandma but she needs to take a second and think about okay does she do, does does he does he make my granddaughter happy does he have a good job? Does he, you know, does he do, does he do right by her? Is, is he this, is he that, it, you know, asking those questions rather than leading with, Oh, the tattoos or in the, in the case of the smoking, um, I've never really gotten, you know, I've got people will give me a hard time, which that's a little bit different than judgment. But I think if I wasn't motivated to quit, if somebody, you know, reached out to me and, you know, asked me about, you know, over however long of a period of time it took, ask me if you ever, if you ever thought about quitting. You know, you know what this does to you. You know, leading with that rather than oh, I I don't want smokers in my house, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Because part of it is with smoking, it's it's an alleged stress reliever, and it's something that you know that it it's just becomes a stupid habit that has the uh, has a physical physically addicting part of it that that makes it very tough to break. Um, so, I mean, I think leading with understanding on both sides, both the person who's the um, the sinner uh, in this case, to use, the, to use that terminology, and then the person who's having to be in the presence of the person, I, I think it, it should go, the, the extension of grace and uh, politeness and humanity should go, should proceed from both counts. If that, hopefully that makes some sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, and I, I like what, where you say that, the conditioning, because I think that that is very integral to this, especially in our modern era. We are so conditioned to think certain things. Now, even if none of us were la raised libertarians, a lot of us have been in the liber liberty movement for so long that we lose our grasp with what it's like to be outside of it. And so we get conditioned into saying taxation is theft. It is. It is. 
But we say that to people that are kind of not sure. And so we drive them away because of it. And, and we say, you know, and we forget that, hey, look, that's a great saying because it's accurate. And maybe that's a great destination, but we got to drive them to the destination, right? And we need more people that are willing to drive people to, to that destination than people who are just talking about the destination all the time. Right. You know, ultimately, it's like talking about the great things on the surface of Mars all the time with no capability of getting there. And it's like, well, Mars might have great things on the surface, but if I have no vehicle to get there, isn't this just a gigantic back massage? I can talk about the values of Ancapistan all day. Like, it's going to be awesome, guys, when we get there. But if I'm unwilling to drive the vehicle that gets people to Ancapistan, what, am I going to live there alone? No, that's not possible. And so when we really judge people, it's out of this conditioning to say, oh, oh, I know I'm smart on this. I know I'm really good at this. I'm going to... I'm going to beat you intellectually and win this fight and I'm going to judge your life and I'm going to I'm going to make you feel unwelcome and I'm going to look so great after I after I make you feel unwelcome. And yeah, you might look good in front of your friends that were already committed to the cause, but I mean, have you really helped anybody get any closer? Have you really planted any seeds or done anything that that puts us in a better situation? And and I find that most of the time we just really haven't and it's that conditioning that we need to get rid of. Remember your humanity. You know, I, I, I hate, you know, I hate to go back to the Bible again, but this saying be, be in the world and not be of it. Do you hate to be, uh, do you hate to go back to the Bible, Hody? No, I can talk about religion all day, but I do want to appeal to everybody. I have so many friends from outside of it. And I really like, it, it's funny because for me, my political philosophy is different than my religious philosophy. No, they what are, is it? they are compatible, but I, and I have a lot of respect for it, like Godarchy and the Mike Meharry and Trisha Stewart. You know, these are people who actually came to anarchy through the vehicle of Christianity. For me, Christianity and, you know, anarchy or, or uh, libertarianism don't are compatible. I didn't necessarily get to one because of the other. Right. So, but, so I'm not saying it's not possible. That's just not the way that I arrived at it. But... I, I will say, he says, be in the world, not be of it. Now, people focus on not being of the world, right? So we want to fill ourselves with all these virtues. But then they completely forget to be in the world. They completely mm -hmm. forget what it's like to relate to normal humans, to, to normal people. And if we just keep coming at him with this nasty, hateful, judgmental rhetoric, we're never really going to get any change that we want in the right direction. Ultimately, the things that made the biggest changes in my life were the people that talked to me out of love and understanding as opposed to judgment and condemnation. And, uh, I mean, you'll find that that's true in religion. You'll also find that's true in politics. I mean, the most successful people in our history really went at it from that direction. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's that's part of the problem with when you're dealing with whether it's... And it's just basically good PR, whether you're dealing with, you know, bringing people to a religious cause or bringing people to liberty... You have to, you have to have, you know, on one level good PR, but you also have to build a bridge with your humanity, as Michael Hyatt likes to say. Um, he's another betterment guy along the leadership side of the house. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I've, I really don't have the, like I said, since we started off so seriously, I don't have any muster for the, for the silliness right now, except for, for interrupting you. But I, I think the, the best thing to do is to you know, along those lines, just lead with your humanity, recognize that, you know, see your, try to see yourself in the other person. And yeah, sometimes you're going to want to smack the other person upside the head. Don't, you know, you have to, it's almost a dichotomy. I think now that I'm kind of talking again, you, you, on the one hand, you want to hold up the good, you want to hold up the good to other people and embody the state, but you do that by embodying the standard rather than, or trying to embody the standard rather than, preaching to some rules if that makes any sense yeah you know it's time for our final thoughts here so let me give you a give you mine and that is just i want to make a challenge if you are listening to not engage with somebody that you don't love and i think that that puts a stop to a lot of the condemnation and the judgment and if you still want to get the right ideas to cross and you see somebody who said something you don't like Step one, love them first. And then step two is help them correct it. And I want you to take that, like whether you're in front of your computer and you're about to argue with somebody on Facebook or you get into a Thanksgiving argument at family dinner, whatever it may be, 
just take it take time be like man i really love this person and that will help drive how you talk to them and how you deal with them because at that point it's not judgment it it's we talk about criticism and they talk about constructive criticism the opposite is destructive criticism and really that's where the judgment is you're trying to destroy their house of cards and we're so focused on where they're wrong or why we don't like them or the way they're living their lives say look how easy for it is for me to give destructive criticism to try and tear down their house of cards as opposed to try and say like hey how about instead of that house of cards we build on that like that's a great house but how about instead of using cards we use wood bricks let's improve that let's make this better you know to say like hey i really love you dale i'm really sad to see that you're smoking and i really want to have a lot of years with you as opposed to just like He's a smoker. He loves to flush money down the toilet. What an idiot. You know, like, it's just, it, 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 will, it I, will. I object. I object because I still, I still flush money down the toilet with, uh, with the, with this gum that, that keeps me <laughs> sane when I don't have cigarettes. And the cigarettes are often more enjoyable, but I appreciate the fact that you want to have me around for a while. Yeah. And I want to see you prosper and I want to see you healthy and, and, and all these things. And so really step one Make sure you love the person. If you there's no way you're going to love this person, why argue with them? Why? It's a waste of time. It's all hate. There's no reason. Nobody's going to change their mind. Have, have you ever changed your mind because somebody hates you, slapped you enough? That's just abuse. And so we really don't do... You don't do this physically. We condemn it personally. We condemn it in person. Why wouldn't we connect it, condemn it also with all our other interactions? And so really that's what I want to say is how to get rid of judgment. I'm not telling you to stop being constructive. I'm not telling you to stop delivering criticism. But love the person you're talking to first. Build that build that up before you decide to tear before you decide to tear them down. Remember that you're not tearing their da them down. You want to maybe tear a behavior down, tear a philosophy down. But the only way you're going to get past that or, or get into that, you're going to have to get past them first. So the only way they're going to let you touch their ideology to change it or their behaviors to change it is if you get past the gatekeeper of them first. And the only way you're going to get past that interface is if they know that you love them and they've let their guards down. And so, yeah, that's my final thoughts. Dale, what do you got to say? Uh, my final thoughts, I'm going to overlay some some Christianity with Buddhism because uh, and I'm not necessarily a syncretist here, but I think the two ideas kind of intermingle. You, you want to cultivate love for people, but the, the thing that you need to learn to do is to try to detach, which doesn't necessarily mean you disengage your emotions, but you, you try to bring yourself to a point with the person or persons where you, you, kind of, you kind of learn to cut off attachment and aversion. They're really the same thing, love and hate. And so you, if, you learn, if you can learn to, to detach and look at the situation or the person objectively, as a person, I think that's a great lead in to learning how to love unconditionally. Um, not that there's not feelings involved with that. I don't necessarily want to go into the ins and outs of, of detachment. I think that's a that's a key that's a key lever to, to lift on to try to get you to the point where you can interact, even if you have to, because there may be a situation where you have to interact with this person, or you know they're they're part of your your Facebook group, or they're part or they're you work with them. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key is to learn to detach. And then with time, that's that's no like instant fix. But over time, as you learn to detach and view things objectively or more objectively, I should say, I think that will help in not making judgments. And it, it'll limit the amount of judgments that you make from necessarily the worth of the person to the worth of the ideas and, you know, the things that you're talking about and, you know, ultimately driving towards a better result those are my final thoughts awesome well dale we're gonna do it again next week buddy uh sorry yeah. I, sorry i cut off your jokes uh i'm gonna no, cut it's... the feed and you can go ahead and and do the do the stand up and maybe that'll be some bonus content so you know <laughs> so, maybe yeah so subscribe to our patreon everybody uh we are so uh share it rate it like it tell us about how you feel uh, Dale and I appreciate all the advice. Again, WeAreLibertarians.com and Simplistic Advice with Dale Melchin. Check them both out, and we look forward to catching you next time. SimplisticAdvice.com. Yes, check.